Good morning, everyone. I think the, the wind and the rain has made a lot of people think, let's just stay at home. So good morning, everyone, on YouTube this morning. Um, wherever you are joining us, whenever you are joining us, be it live now or um, during the week or the weeks to come, you are very welcome, and it's great to have you joining our, uh, our service this morning. My name is Jill. Um, I will be leading the worship time this morning, and then later on, um, Jill, will, it's easy to remember, Jill will be bringing God's word to us. And Jill will be bringing God's word to us when she speaks. Remember that. Remember that this is the word of God coming to you. Is that that should be so exciting to you this morning. Um, the children will be leaving us later, um, older ones up, younger ones over there. And um, uh, the toilets are an accessible toilet in the foyer, other toilets out there, tea and coffee afterwards. I don't think I've missed anything. That's the housekeeping done. That's what I've got written, housekeeping. I'm going to start by reading. All of our readings this morning are coming from Proverbs. Proverbs is just brilliant. And this first reading is from Proverbs 8, which I think if I've got a favourite chapter of Proverbs, this is probably it. And when you get home, link it to Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and just see how they tie in with um, these words in, in Proverbs, which... If it's not about Jesus, I don't know who it's about. It says, The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works, before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. When there were no oceans, I was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills... I was given birth before he made the earth or its fields or any of the dust of the world. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundaries so that the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then... I was the craftsman by his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and rejoicing in mankind. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will be with us here this morning, Lord, that you will speak to us all individually and as a group of your people. Lord, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will hear you speak to us this morning. Lord, I just thank you that that is your desire. Your desire is to speak to us. Lord, give us ears to listen. Give us a heart to hear your voice this morning. Amen. We're going to start by singing two songs. We're going to sing When I See the Beauty, which I think links in beautifully with that reading from Proverbs 8. And then, um, Great are you, you, Father, great is your faithfulness. Okay. When I see the beauty of the sunset's glory, amazing earth just across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of the distant galaxy, it was a dumbass me. God of mercy. 
mercy will shed humanity and suffered by our side. Of the cross they nailed you to, that could not hold you. Now you're making all things new by the power of your risen life. What can I do? But give my life to you Hallelujah Hallelujah What can I do But praise you Every day make everything I do Hallelujah Hallelujah I do But thank you What can I do But give my life to you Hallelujah, Hallelujah, what can I do but praise you every day, make everything I do. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Surrender the sun. 
stars of heaven, I will confess, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness, your goodness and mercy follow me. Great is your faithfulness, great is your faithfulness to me. Goodness and mercy follow me. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. We're going to watch a video, video mainly for the children, but I love Douglas. I don't apologise for having Douglas again. I think Douglas is very wise, and this is Douglas talking about wisdom. So uh, thank you, Brian. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most important things that you can have in your life. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and uh, today I wanted to talk to you guys about wisdom. Yeah, wisdom. Wisdom is one of the most important things that we can have in our lives. The Bible talks about wisdom a lot. Yeah. The Bible says that even if it costs you all you have, go get wisdom. Wisdom is that important. And specifically, godly wisdom, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. But when I was thinking about this topic, I, I really wanted to know what the difference is between wisdom and knowledge, right? Both are kind of big words, but really knowledge pretty much means what you know, what you know in your head. But wisdom is using what you know to make good choices. Yeah, if knowledge tells you if something is true or false, wisdom tells you if something is good or bad. One of my favorite explanations of what wisdom is versus what knowledge is, is, is knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable. And wisdom is not putting that tomato in a fruit salad, because that would be really nasty. And just because you have knowledge does not mean that you're actually gonna make the wise choice. See, like for example, I, I know that a wasp is way meaner than a honeybee. And I also know what a wasp nest looks like and what a honeybee hive looks like. But I saw a wasp nest, and I still went over there and poked it with a stick, which did not turn out well. I got stung all over the place, and I should have known. I did know. I had the knowledge that this was a bad idea, but I still did it. I was being unwise. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which is a really difficult thing to understand unless you, you know, sit down and think about it for a little bit. Because when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it's not saying that you should be scared of God all the time and then you'll be wise. No, what it's saying is that if you care what God thinks, that's the only way that you can truly be wise. Yeah, there's two kinds of wisdom. There's godly wisdom and there is earthly wisdom. And we want to have the godly wisdom. We want to have the wisdom that Jesus had. We want to have the ability to know right from wrong. We want to have the ability to know what is good and bad. We want to be able to make wise choices. And if you want to be wise, the Bible says all we have to do is ask God, and he'll help us to be wise, which is awesome. I know I want to be wise. I want to make the wise choice so I don't get stung up by wasps and things like that, but also just all kinds of things in life. Aside from being stung, there's all kinds of things. Wisdom is useful in just about 
everything. In fact, I'm having a hard time thinking of something where wisdom is not useful. So knowledge and wisdom are a little bit related because you need knowledge to have wisdom. But just because you have the knowledge does not mean that you'll have the wisdom. So it's a really good thing to read your Bible and to know what's in it. You know, like in Sunday school, if you have all the answers, that's fine. But if that's all you have is just the answers in your head, but you don't live out what you're learning from the Bible, then all you have is knowledge and no wisdom. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would get knowledge, but most importantly that you would get wisdom, that you would ask God to help you to be wise, and that you would search for wisdom with all your heart, everything that you've got, because there are very few things in this life that are as important as godly wisdom. Today, we're going to... And we're doing, um, for the for the grown-ups in here, we're going through the book of Proverbs at the moment, and... The book of Proverbs was written by a man called Solomon, who was a great king. And God told Solomon that he could have anything that he wanted. And what Solomon asked for was wisdom. And I think that just showed how wise he was already, really, to ask for God's wisdom in his life. And, yeah, he, he wrote this amazing book of Proverbs using God's wisdom, wisdom to teach us so I'm just going to pray for us that we will have that wisdom in our lives. Heavenly Father, I do pray for all of us here this morning and for the little ones that you will give them your wisdom, that when they're presented with situations that they don't know what to do, Lord, I just pray that instead of just trying to figure it out for themselves, that they will turn to you and maybe look at your Bible or or maybe just pray that you will show them the way that they should go rather than them just trying to figure it out for themselves. Lord, we know that you want to help them. And Lord, we thank you for that. Amen. Ian. Good morning. I might be the counterpoint to wisdom. Who knows? Um... <laughs> a few thank yous to start with with our notices today um, thank you for people who came last night and brought friends to the quiz it was fun well I enjoyed, I enjoyed it and I was stood up here so it was good um, thank you from food bank as well we took nearly 200 kilograms of soup last week which is quite a lot of soup um, apparently they do a sum and they work out the weight of food that's donated and figure out how many people that will feed. And apparently that's about 600 people's worth of meals. That'd be a lot of soup, wouldn't that? But hey, uh, but yeah, and there is scope to bring more. I know there was already some in the foyer this morning, but you know, you can carry on bringing soup and other things. So yeah, thank you for that. A um, couple of things coming up. We've got a prayer meeting tomorrow evening, which is here. Um, 31st of October, so uh, that evening, uh, we've got our light party, and I suspect Linda still needs help. Linda's sitting over in the corner at the moment. Um, you may have seen on your news sheet, I hope so, we have an exciting opportunity. Does anybody like exciting opportunities? Yeah. Yeah, good. Anybody other than Steve want an exciting opportunity? <laughs> yeah? I want a bit more enthusiasm here, people. We've got an exciting opportunity for people to come and help work up in the box up there, working the stuff that makes sound come out of that and pictures come up on the screens. Okay, we really do need some people. You are not too old to learn. In fact, I was thinking this week, I couldn't find a proverb about not being too old to learn and facing your fears and that sort of stuff, but I'm sure there must be some. Uh, and I think, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone is a really good thing, and it's a wise thing to do. Um, and, you know, just in case that feels really bad, you, you can come and have a look, and if it really doesn't work for you, you don't, you're not committing yourself to the next 20 years' worth of sitting in the booth with, you know, Brian or me or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, we do need some people up there, so please do come and talk to us. What else? Oh, yeah, a couple of prayer points. So Steve is going to Christian Union to do a talk. That's this week, isn't it? So we're going to pray for Steve. And also, many of you will know that my commandee's son, Dan, has been in hospital, uh, had a diabetic event, shall we say, doing slightly better. Yep, yeah, 
Yes. Doing slightly better, hopefully coming home today, but we'll pray for them anyway. And then we'll pray for the children and young people to come out. So I shall pray. Father, we thank you for opportunities we have to reach out, and I thank you for the opportunity that Steve has on Tuesday to go to Christian Union. And Lord, we also thank you for your faithfulness to us and for the way that you look after us and care for us. And Lord, we thank you for the way that you've been with Dan and with Mike and Mandy over these last days. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to, to be with them as a family and bring Dan, Dan home safely. And now, Lord, I pray for our young people, for our children. Lord, I ask that you would bless them in their lessons, that, as Jill's already said, that you would give them knowledge, but more importantly, you give them wisdom to apply that knowledge. Father, we thank you for them. Amen. Off you go. Year four that way, year five that way. Before Jill comes to speak to us, we are going to um, have a time of prayerful worship. This is the way I'm going to say it. So I'm going to read some, another passage from um, Proverbs, and then we're going to have three songs, and all of them are quite reflective um, songs. I think they go along well with the, um, with the passages and the passage that Jill is going to speak from this morning from um, Proverbs 2. And I just want to say prayer is, prayer is a passion of mine, but prayer, we're told in Thessalonians to pray continually. And that's to have an attitude of prayer because prayer, I think, for so many people is a scary old thing. And they have this vision in their mind of what prayer is. And they think that prayer is um, either hands together and being terribly, terribly clever or having to get into a great big group and speak when actually you feel uncomfortable doing that. And now, I'm not saying that that's you know, wrong because I love it when the church gets together to pray and is actually, and uh, what I've learned is because I'm a bit of a gibberer that God does not mind the gibbering. He just loves it when we bring our prayers to him. But prayer is something that you do when you're walking along, when you're walking the dog, when you're doing the washing, when you're at work and you, you know, something's going wrong. It's I think that's what it was meant when we're told to that, that tiny verse that is so powerful in the New Testament, pray continually. So praying with music, praying while we're singing these songs, using these songs, um, if you want to, get on your knees. If you want to, stand up. If you want to, sit down. Do what if you want to. They're not dancey ones, really, but you can sway. Um, just use them to pray, use them to ask for God's wisdom, use them to bring whatever is in your heart, whatever is in your life, whatever joys and whatever sorrows you've got, use these songs to bring those before God. It's easy just to sing the songs and just to go through the motions, but we're not supposed to do that when we worship. Worship is so much more than that. So well, I'm just going to read these verses from Proverbs 3, and then we're going to sing um, three songs before Jill comes to, work, to speak to us. It says, and I've got quite an old Bible, so it says man, and I'm going to read man. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is at her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. 
Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. Um, and th I know those verses um, in her left hand are riches and honour, and I think Tim really did address this last week, but riches and honour do not necessarily mean riches and honour in the way that we, in our, in our you know, the society looks at them. Riches and honour before God are so different. Okay. We're going to sing three songs. Waymaker, Beautiful Lord, Wonderful Saviour, and Lord, You Are More Precious Than Silver. Even when I don't 
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship
just pray that these songs, these prayers will be rising to your throne like incense, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you desire to hear us come to you in worship, in prayer, in praise. There's nothing you desire more. And Lord, I just pray that for everyone here, there should be nothing we desire more than to come to you and to hear your voice. Amen. In a moment, Jill's going to come and speak to us um, about Proverbs chapter 2. So I'm going to read chapter 2 of Proverbs before she comes up. My son, if you accept my words and, and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. And if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright, he is a shield to those whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who leave the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. It will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive words who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. For her house leads down to death, and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus, 
You will walk in the ways of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. Heavenly Father, I just pray now as Jill comes to bring your word to us. I pray for Jill as she delivers what you want to say to us and Lord I thank you that you have been with her as she has prepared to speak to us this morning. Amen. Thank you Jill. Can you guys hear me okay? It's good to join you this morning and share God's word and you've got one job to do today. One job, while you're listening to me, is to decipher what is the one thing that God wants you to take action on today. So open your hearts to Holy Spirit. What is the one thing that God wants you to take action on after something that you've heard, either in the service or in this talk? Now, I love the Bible. I think you can tell. Uh, It's lost its cover. It's lost its back. It finishes at Hebrews 5 because the rest is on my table because it's so thumbed. And I probably do really need to get a new Bible. You can see it's all falling apart. And this book you'll never come to the end of. But it will come to the end of you. It's a book that will bring you to your brokenness, to your frayed ends, to your hopes and your fears. It holds history and it holds the future all in its pages. But it doesn't contain exact commands for every single situation that might come up in life. But instead, it gives gives us biblical principles that, when applied, can help us navigate any situation. And these are the biblical principles of wisdom. Now, many of Solomon's sayings relate to two kinds of people that he's speaking to, the wise and the foolish, or the righteous and the wicked. And you can make your own conclusion of which one you are. But we also see that he offers us two paths. And we're free to take either one. One is the one that the righteous and the wise take, and the other is the path that the foolish and the wicked take. And actually, Psalm 1, now it's not Proverbs, but Psalm 1, just creates a great picture for us to see this clearly. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord And on this law he meditates night and day. And he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaves do not fail, but whatever he does prospers. That's one path. That's a path of wisdom. But not so the wicked. They're like chaff. And they're blown to and fro like the wind blows. And they won't stand when it comes to judgment. And they won't, as sinners, sit in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous and the wicked. But the wicked will perish. That's the second path that you can take. And Deuteronomy tells us in Deuteronomy 30 that God has given us a choice. See, I have set before you life and death. Blessings and curses. Now, choose life. 
There is a price to pay to gain spiritual wisdom, as we're going to discover. But there's an even greater price if we don't discover spiritual wisdom. And Proverbs 2 is a passionate plea from a father to his son to understand the benefits of walking on the right path, the path of wisdom. Now, for those of you that have got children or grandchildren or even nieces and nephews, you may have heard yourself saying, if you just eat your vegetables, you can have some sweets later. Or if you behave today, you can stay up late. And Solomon is giving us these kind of options, these conditions. Solomon's saying, if you treasure wisdom and apply yourself to understanding it, if you train yourselves to hear my words and open your spirit wide to what it means, if you cry out for understanding and you seek it like you're mining for something so precious, like treasure in the hidden places, then and only then will you find it. And Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened to you. But if you look around the world today, and this is just a personal opinion, wisdom is in short supply, isn't it? We just have to look at politics at home and abroad to know that wisdom is not in abundance. It's a hard road to take. But it's encouraging for me, one who is foolish, that God's wisdom is available if I seek it. Verse 5 tells us that if we seek God and seek wisdom in this way, we'll discover the fear of the Lord and find true knowledge of God. You know, I may upset a few people today, but wisdom isn't spending 10 minutes doing your devotion. Tick. Praying when something doesn't go your way. Tick. And coming to church enjoying it, but not doing anything with what you've heard. Tick. That's not the wisdom that God has for us. We might have the word of the Lord, but we never get the Lord of the word. Wisdom is searching and pouring over and spending time and surrendering what we would really love to do to seek him. Over the last few months, God's called me to spend three hours every morning in prayer. And I think it's the hardest thing that he's called me to do. Because if you know me, and some of you saw me on the retreat when I came down into, in my pyjamas into the kitchen, I am not a morning person. But I know that I can't do the work that I do without being in union with God. And that takes time. I have to align myself and remind myself again, I am a daughter of the risen King. I have to remember and place myself in Jeremiah 29, 11, for he knows the plans that he has for you today, Jill. Plans to prosper you and bring you hope plans for a future. I have to make sure that I seek him first, that I seek the kingdom first. 
I have to remind myself that all things are possible for those that trust in him. I have to know that when I come across situations, I don't react like the world reacts. I don't respond like the world responds. But I'm so in union with him that I can recognize this is a moment when I need your wisdom, when I need your understanding. Unless, of course, you've ever driven with me in a car, you know that is when I fail abysmally, and we all have those moments. But wisdom is available to you and to me from a generous God. It's a gift from a generous God. And every word he speaks is like revelation and relationship bubbling up within us so that we are in the right frame of mind to make the choices of the day. Wisdom might be hard to seek and search and appropriate in our lives. But Proverbs 2 goes on to say, there are many rewards of wisdom. <clears throat> wisdom enables you to be victorious over your battles. And there are many. There are a growing number of battles that we face. The economy is working against us. The stress of the population in most countries is at an all-time high. Our health has never been so poor. Addiction, anger, frustration, hopelessness. And wisdom makes us victorious in the big things, and the little things. And by the way, in the Old Testament, wisdom is given a female personification. But by the time we get to the New Testament, wisdom is a person, Jesus. And so when we seek wisdom, we seek Jesus. Another reward is he can become your personal bodyguard, shielding and guarding you as you learn the ways to choose what is right in him. You will also discover what is just and proper and fair. In other words, you'll discover his perspective on your life and the world that we live in. And that empowers you then to make good decisions right decisions, better decisions. When wisdom wins your heart and revelation and understanding breaks in, you'll find lasting pleasures, Proverbs 2 tells us. You'll find a peace that passes understanding, a joy that comes in difficult moments, a sense of connection not broken with him. And it will rescue you from evil in disguise, from those who walk in ways of darkness, from the world structures that often work against the little man and woman, from everything that would seek to draw us away from being fully convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord. And wisdom becomes a process in our lives by which we have a safe and secure place that we can deflect all the rubbish that would come our way. And it counsels us in our foolishness. I love that. That wisdom in my foolishness will counsel me. Wisdom isn't always the easiest path to take. And often it can be a hard decision to say no to that job because you know it will sacrifice family time or no to that relationship because of what they believe. 
or saying yes to doing something that nobody will know. You'll get no pat on the back. There's no seeming reward, but God's calling you to do it, to serve. After my first year in drama school, the Lord broke into my life in a wonderful and beautiful way. Many of you have heard that story. I'm not going to share it now, but if you want to know it, come and, come and ask me any time. And so I had a summer where I just naively enjoyed getting to know God and getting to know God's people. And our first day back at drama school was always the most exciting one. And if you've ever seen fame, yes, it's like that. They put the big sheets of the uh, productions they're doing and everybody's roles and what you're doing. Now, I've already said I'm not a morning person, so by the time I got up, everybody had read what they were doing. And I was, I was walking through the corridors and people were looking at me as I was walking to find out what my role was. And they were saying, <laughs> oh, 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 Jill. I was like, what? What's happened? And when I got to read the roles, I had been given a part in a play that was set in the northeast of England called Strippers. Or Strippers, as they say. And my part was to open the show with a strip. Now, if you knew me back then, you knew I'd go for anything. I wouldn't. wouldn't have battered an eyelid. I'd have just done it to my shame. But Christ had changed my life. And I didn't know why, but I knew it wouldn't honour him if I did it. So I wrote a letter to my principals and they called me in and they said, darling, you'll never get on in this industry if you're that old-fashioned. And I didn't care because I'd never experienced what I'd experienced. But as we were having this conversation, the most favourite director in the drama school walked through and said, oh, what's going on here? And they said, oh, darling, Jill's just so old-fashioned. She's not going to be able to be in the show. We're not going to put her into anything. And he said, oh, that's great. She can come and work with me. Because they didn't have the budget for an assistant. And so for that term, I had the best life ever. And I learned alongside an incredibly good director to direct um, my peers. And do you know what? That experience alone stood me in good stead for so many amazing experiences and opportunities that I had for the Lord. And Romans 8 tells us on the backdrop of things being difficult that we know all things work for the good of those who love Christ, who are called according to his purposes. And if you truly value having God's wisdom in your life, over and above your own wisdom, because his ways and his thoughts are so much higher, then you'll be able often to track the cost, to spot the difficult decisions, it's measurable. And we should all be able to turn to each other and see the growth of wisdom and maturity and the proof that we're growing in him. Can you? Can you? Well, as we read down to verse 16, <clears throat> we have this uh, 16 to 19 is a, a warning about those who would commit adultery. But I believe behind this section, there's a deeper meaning here because Proverbs speaks about two women. We've got the adulterous woman here in verse 16 and the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, that Linda is going to be speaking to us on a couple of weeks' time. 
And both women speak a parable of two systems. The adulterous woman is a religious and alluring and tempting system, tempting the young ones, it says, to come to her bed of compromise. And I have a reference in my Bible that took me to Mark 7, verse 13, where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And he says, you have nullified the word of God by your traditions that you've handed down. So there's this sense that the adulterous system is built on tradition and man-made wisdom. But the other is the holy bride, the virtuous, pure woman, keeping her first love, keeping her promises, her wedding vows for Christ alone. And her house, is the house of the Lord. See, one of those systems brings shame and pulls us away from Jesus. But the wisdom, the one, protects us. Sorry, the other brings favour and honour and glory and pulls us towards him. And wisdom protects us from one and unites us with the other. If you've been a spiritual um, born-again believer, you would have no doubt experienced the spiritual battle that goes on around us. That we need that protection and union from. That we need to make sure we are always one with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who already has won the victory for us. Of course, we all fall and make mistakes and poor decisions. It's who we are. But before we leave this little section, verse 19 seems to suggest that there's no way back, that there's no recovery but it doesn't take into account repentance and the redemption that comes from the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. We aren't always going to make the right choices, but there's always a way back. And so, in conclusion, with these last few verses of Proverbs 2, we can tell that there is a priceless value in having wisdom and understanding in your life. It won't be easy, and it may cost you a lot. But the final few verses urges us to walk in the ways of the good and the wise and stay on the right path. So align yourself with wise people. Keep short accounts. Don't let anything fester and grow. That's why we have people ready to pray with you in the corner. Because if stuff comes up, deal with it straight away. It's a note of hope that if we live a life of decisions based on understanding God's wisdom, of understanding the fear of the Lord, honouring him, putting him first, being open to his Holy Spirit, then we will live life to its fullest. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and life to the fullest. And we will inherit not only what is in the life to come, but we'll inherit that life now. That's the difference between the two paths. We inherit that goodness, that life, that promise now. But not so the wicked. 
they will be cut off, we're told, from any inheritance, and they will lose all that they could have had. So there are two paths waiting for every one of us. One may require significant change and some difficult decisions for you. The other one may at first appear straight and flat and easy, but will only lead to darkness and wickedness. Which one will you take? It's a daily decision. Which one will you take? Let's pray. Father God, you have set all things before us. You make your truth plain. And within these precepts, there is life or death. There is blessings or curses. Would you open our eyes as we go about and make decisions this week that we might just stop and connect with you and receive your wisdom? Would you highlight those areas of our lives where we're in danger because we're out of that wisdom. And would you encourage us, Lord, where we are beginning to step into your wisdom and make right choices. We thank you that all of this is only possible because of the sacrifice of you, Jesus, on the cross. But in your wisdom, you came down to this earth. You made the Father known and you sacrificed your life that we might live. Praise you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. We're going to be moving into communion um, in just a moment, but before we do, we'll sing a song that will lead us beautifully into um, the time of communion when I survey the wondrous cross.
Behold, the gifts of God for his people. We have the supper of the Lord spread before us. Lift up your minds and hearts above all faithless fears and cares. Let this bread and wine be to you the witness and signs for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Consecrate your, consecrate your lives afresh to God and pray for strength and grace to do and bear his holy will. As we remember Christ's sacrifice for us, for the sin that we have committed for the sin of the world, we can come to this table conscious of our weakness and renouncing that sin. So let's spend a short time in confession. We're going to read together, and then we'll have a short time of silence afterwards, just to think through where we're at. Thank you, Brian. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy, not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under the table, but it is your nature to have mercy, and we depend on that. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, 
that we may forever live in him and he in us. In Romans we read that God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ dies, died for us. And in Matthew's Gospel, we read the disciples did as Jesus directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Would those who are serving please come forward? Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We will each take a cup, and then once everyone is served, we will drink together as a symbol of our unity.
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you have given us and continue to give us. Help us to live up to that call, Lord. Help us to seek your wisdom. We're going to finish this morning by singing a wonderful hymn. And it kind of, the first line, well, the, the, the chorus explains the way I live my life because there's an awful lot I don't know. But I think I know the important thing. I cannot tell, but this I know. So let's, let's stand and sing, I cannot tell. Okay.
we don't know so much we don't know so much we won't know until we are with you in glory but Lord that's what we know we know that our Redeemer lives and we know that when we love him when we trust in him when we give ourselves to him that one day we will be looking at his beautiful face. Lord, I thank you for that so much. I thank you that you've been here among us this morning. I thank you that you give us so much and we can give nothing in comparison back to you. And what we can give, Lord, I pray that you will use wisely for the furtherance of your kingdom. Go with us all as we leave this place, Lord. Be with us all in the coming week. Lord, I pray that each of us will rest not on our own wisdom, but on yours in the coming days. Amen. I'm just going to finish by reading the first few verses of Proverbs 2 again. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom, applying your heart to understanding. And if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will know the under you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God's Amen. Oh,